I want to review some very simple fundamentals about exercise and health. And that'll be about the first half of the talk. Then in the second half, I want to talk about high intensity training and the risk of high intensity training. How many people here think high intensity training is something new? All right, I, I want to explain to you also that it started at least in the 1920s. And there was a wave in the 20s and 30s. There was a wave in the, of circuit training in the 50s and 60s. There was a wave in the 70s, and now there's another wave. So this is at least the fourth wave, the third since I've been alive. Uh, we were, so we're going to talk about the general issue of physical activity and cardiorespiratory fitness on health. We're going to talk about how protective it is and about how the benefits outweigh what we know about what exercise does as to blood pressure, cholesterol, glucose. So blood uh, exercise is more protective than people think. The history of high intensity interval training, what is known about catastrophic health events, especially death, during exercise, what is known about HIT training and cardiovascular risk during exercise. All right, this is a population pyramid of Spain in 1975. A lot of young people, not very many old people. This is a population pyramid of Spain in 2010. Fewer young people, this wave right here moving through, and what's going to happen in 2050 when this wave is up here? It's, it's an interesting question to think about. This pattern is happening essentially everywhere in the world. It's happening first, probably in most, most dramatically in Japan. It's happening all over Europe. It's happening in the United States. And it's starting to happen in places like China and India. It's starting to happen in China and India. And in China, it will be even more dramatic because of the one-child policy. So again, the world is getting older. And, and this is going to really, really, really change all of our assumptions about society, how we live, and what we need to do, and, and this is why, in some ways, it's so important for the people in red to remain physically active and physically fit. Here, because and it turns out that, that the rise in obesity really starts in the U.S. in about 1980. Two things happened in 1980: uh, people started eating a lot more sugar, and, and people started to buy personal computers and personal electronics. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Here's the data for. Um, Here's the data from 1980, and you can see it in the U.S. Proportion of the population uh, that's overweight or obese. In the U.S., it's getting close to 65%. Uh, you can see that Spain was doing very well, but it's starting to drift upward. England is tracking the United States. Canada is pretty, pretty well. Even places like Korea, where you uh, typically think of people as, as, as being skinny, are starting to catch up. And the data for China, which I don't have here, is even more dramatic. <laughs> As they switch from a society that rode their bicycles all around to driving cars and eating a lot of fast food. Uh, you can see again, this is diabetes in the United States. And, and again, nothing, it, it lags. And uh, Spain right here in the purple is doing better than some places, but maybe worse than other places uh, in Europe. Now, I said the risk factors interact. So if you have hypertension, your, your risk of cardiovascular disease is 1.5. If you have uh, cholesterol greater, I think, than 260, it's 2.3. And if your uh, glucose intolerance is 1.8. But if you start having two or three of these problems, it becomes worse. And if you have them all, it's 6.2. It's 6.2. Uh, this shows 77,000 women, I think, studied over... Uh, 24 years, I think, in Norway. And you can see that the guidelines are about here. 30 minutes, five times a week. 150 minutes of, of vigorous or moderately vigorous physical activity per week. And you can see that the hazard ratio of all-cause mortality goes down to about 0.6. And the years of life gain go down to about 0.4. What's interesting is people that do more get additional benefit, but not that much benefit. There are literally hundreds of studies 
starting with the famous study in London of the bus drivers and the conductors that have shown exactly these relationships, almost identical, that you get about a, a, a 30 or 40 or 50 percent reduction in all cause mortality if you're physically active. So again, if we think back to our aging slides, and we think back to the fact that we don't want to have a bunch of disabled older people, uh, we need to promote physical activity. Now, one of the important things, and this is going to get into the high intensity. These are high school graduates, some college. These are graduate degrees, people like you guys. So about 65% or 65% 60, of people with graduate degrees meet the physical activity guidelines for aerobic and probably 30% for strength. If you go to people who are less educated, only about 28% and about 12%. Again, this is the United States. I don't know if you have similar data in Spain, uh, but I would not be surprised if it were similar. If it were similar. And there's similar effects of education in the United States on smoking and obesity. If you look at the smoking, uh, people that have uh, graduate degrees in the United States, only about 5% smoke, where uh, people with less than high school, about 30% smoke. And then I want to bring up the issue of missing risk. So if you just look at all this physical activity on traditional markers of risk, uh, like blood pressure, hypertension, lipids, uh, body mass index, uh, diabetes, other, other markers, you only uh, predict about 50, you, you, you only explain about 59% of the protective effect of exercise on cardiovascular disease and only about 35% on coronary heart disease. So cardiovascular disease is strokes and peripheral disease as well as heart disease. So there's a lot of missing risk and exercise is far more protective than people think. And it's working through other factors uh, than simple blood pressure on high intensity training. And I want to ask you, is anything new? Has anybody ever heard of Gerstler and Rindel? These are two of the individuals in Germany who in the 20s and 30s started thinking about interval training. And they were, they were both physicians and coaches. I think Rindel was a cardiologist and Gerstler was mostly a trainer. And they were some of the very, very early adopters of interval training. And they had a brilliant pupil, a man named Rudolf Harbig, who ran 146.6 for 800 meters in 1939. That was a record that stood until the middle 1950s. He also broke 46 seconds for 400 meters. He died in World War II. Uh, but this is a picture of Harbig uh, setting that record. And Hardwig did a program that actually looks an awful lot like cross the north of Canada. Because they were worried that the Russians were going to fly bombers over the North Pole and bomb Canada and the United States. I mean, this sounds crazy now, but people were really worried about it. All right? And so they set up these air bases up there, uh, up there in these really cold places, and they did not build gymnasiums because it's hard to build stuff up there. And they noticed that the pilots were getting fat and out of shape and couldn't pass their physical fitness test when they brought them back to, uh, you know, back to the, the southern parts of Canada. So they developed this program called 5BX, which is five basic exercises, which is circuit training and push ups of muscle mass. So there was a lot of interest in the 1970s. The older people in the group will, will remember. There was a lot of interest in the 1970s in something that looks a lot like high-intensity training, eccentric contractions that we hear about today. We hear about today. So this, I told you there's at least several waves, and now there's this one. So ideas have been around since at least the 1930s, maybe the 1920s. Uh, circuit training, adult fitness, uh, 1950s and 60s. Some of this was actually low volume, high intensity exercise designed for these Canadian pilots where it was freezing. Uh, the strength uh, training community has been thinking about this for a while. 
and 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 there's been several waves of it in the strength training uh, world. So what about catastrophic events? Not much is known about catastrophic events during high intensity training. So we're going to look about catastrophic events during exercise as a whole. Yes, these are the survivors in red. But if you look at, at the, uh, there's a lot of people with cardiomyopathy. Uh, there's other people that have had um, <coughs> coronary artery disease and so forth. And that's the other big thing that you don't know about is how, many, how much cardiomyopathy is out there. So when you hear about young athletes dying you know, in, in, in professional sports or when they're 20 years old, frequently, frequently these individuals have some form of cardiomyopathy. And this is about one, in, in Minnesota, about one out of 200,000 kids who participate in high school sports die. So every few years, there is somebody, some young Typically kid. you see uh, of 75% of VO2 max for you know 30 minutes a day, 40 minutes a day. Typically, you see a rise in maximal oxygen consumption of about 0.4 liters. If you look at all these interval training studies, you got closer to 0.5. And <laughs> if you look at the people who really did a lot in our studies, in this, in this study we looked at, uh, if you look at, at, at the groups of individuals who did three to five minute intervals with three to five minutes rest, uh, you got increases in, in VO2 max of let's see, almost 0.87 liters per minute. Almost 0.87 liters. So almost a liter. Almost a liter. When you did really intense interval training. Uh, and many of the interval training studies would these large increases use longer intervals of three to five minutes in duration. Again, things that we've all heard before, but I think this study should provide strong evidence. It's too good to be true. The authors report a case of exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis in a male athlete exercise physiology professor who started a high-intensity resistance training program after a period of detraining. So this guy should have known better. So the fact that he was a professor was not protective. Uh, the subject performed one high intensity resistance training session that consisted of 48 total sets of push-ups, 24, and chin-ups, with no rest between sets. <coughs> Two days after the exercise session, the subject reported cola-colored cola urine. On arriving at the hospital, test results indicated elevated myoglobin and creatinine kinase levels of uh, 50,000 units, uh, normal is 20 to 200. Treatment included hydration, bicarbonate, uh, uh, and monitoring things. Three weeks post treatment, the subject started exercise again. This case study illustrates that unaccustomed exercise in the form of high intensity resistance training may be harmful uh, to detrained athletes. And this just shows how his creatine kinase recovered. So again, even people that know better don't always know better. Uh, this is data from commando training. So there's no real data on injury rates in CrossFit, but if you're training 25 weeks, you had about a 30% risk of serious musculoskeletal injury. Strains, sprains, things more than just regular soreness. And this is an 18 thousand Royal Marine Commandos, again, about 30 percent. About 30 percent. No good data yet on CrossFit. A lot of case reports. So we've talked today about the protective effects of physical activity and exercise on health. Talked to you about the missing risk idea, that even if you have some risk factors, being physically active or being